So it's, uh, I think, official time to start. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor John Landis from uh, Mechanical, Aerospace, and Biomedical Engineering Department. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, going to do something today that's a little bit more applied than maybe what you've been doing, which is try to use a real engineering problem for optimization. And uh, we talked about this, and I'm going to give you an introduction if my machine stops trying to update itself in the middle of my lecture. Um, anyway, if during the course of this work you need to contact me, this is my name, John Landis. I'm in MABE, which is Mechanical Aerospace and Biomedical Engineering. My office is Perkins 314, and this is my email. Easiest way to contact me would be with email, but I'm usually in my office Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, this time, 9 to 11. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 to 11. Of course, from 9 to 10, you have a class. You wouldn't want to miss that. And I want to start out by talking about design. The exercise we want to do is called design optimization. And it's the design of a helical compression spring. And I want to give you some background in design and tell you why it's a topic that you could perhaps be able to do. The class that I teach that this comes from is called machine design. And it's uh, machine design in mechanical engineering, ME 466. I don't know if any of you are mechanical engineers. If you are, it's a required course. For people in other engineering curricula like biomedical, aerospace, or nuclear, it's an optional course. And some people take it as, as an elective. It is not a capstone design course if you're any kind of engineer, you end up doing capstone design. Probably you're several years away from that, but your last year you have to do a capstone design which usually takes a whole year, one semester to design things and then another semester to build things and you end up building something, actually building. In this course we don't actually build it something, we just do paper design. And mostly this course deals with tools of design and so th this is one of the tools. In the tools of design, we take little kind of components like gears and uh, shafts and, and uh, bearings and things like that and learn to design them very briefly, albeit. But this is one of the things they do, which is springs. And w we were talking about perhaps instead of doing for your math just a problem that, that has no physical significance to try to give you something that really had a physical basis and a physical significance. So we came up with this idea for at least to try it. Um, some, this is arm waving stuff. You don't need to know this real good, but it, we always talk about this in the beginning. What is design definition? Formulation of a plan to satisfy a need. After you hear that definition, you don't know any more than you knew before, but that's, that's from somebody's book. So. But you can design things like clothing, software, and for what we do, machine parts. Now, the thing about design, unlike most of your courses, there's not a correct solution or an incorrect solution. Most of your problems, you have this problem, you either get the answer right or wrong. In design, you don't get it right or wrong, you get a better answer or a worse answer. And so I want to talk about better and worse a little bit. What is better in design? A better design might be design something that costs less or that's easier to use. Or the one thing that we concentrate on is design without failure. When you design a part and it fails, it can have serious consequences. And that's one of the areas I work in called fatigue and fracture. So I want to give you some examples of things that are fairly serious when designs failed. So here are some examples. Um, well, some more words. When, when something fails, let's say, it can be anywhere from an annoyance to a big disaster. Now, think of things failing. Your light bulb fails. Eh, you change it. 
your car part fails. Some part fails on your car. You get used to that, especially if you drive an old car. But it fails usually in the morning when you're coming to school and it's raining and you have an exam you have to get to and then something fails and that's a big annoyance and you don't like that. Or think, think of this, an airplane. There's an airplane crash due to a design problem and it happens in Outer Mongolia. That's news item for page seven or eight in, in somebody's newspaper, maybe not even yours. Happens at McGee-Tyson, then it's a big, big news. If it happens and you know somebody on the airplane that was killed, it's a big disaster. So design, can, design failures can be anywhere from just an annoyance to a big disaster. I want to show you some examples in history that were kind of fun to look at. Uh, this is called Boston Molasses Tank Failure, and it happened about 90 years ago, 1921. And it's sort of humorous 90 years ago, but at the time probably wasn't so humorous. In a cold day in January, a big molasses tank in the middle of Boston burst. It had over uh, 6 million gallons of molasses in it, and molasses came out of the tank in waves up to 15 feet high. Now, I don't know if you ever tried swimming in molasses. I haven't, but I can't imagine that it would be very easy to do or much fun. Anyway, the reports being 90 years old are a little bit scattered, but somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 40 people were killed and over 100 injured, and horses. Horses were important back then. I often wondered what's a molasses tank doing in the middle of a city, and reading more about it, I uh, recently found out that it was part of a brewery. So apparently they were making, using this molasses to make some beverage that people liked. And the interesting thing about this, if you remember U.S. history, there was a period where they had prohibition and this molasses tank failed just a couple weeks before the prohibition amendment went into the Constitution. So it must have been a forerunner. But th this is one, one disaster that people had no idea what caused it, but it was a big disaster. Now here's another one. British Common Airplane. This is the very first commercial jetliner. And this jetliner had some design problems. And due to design problems, some of these flew apart in mid-flight. The fuselage just burst apart. And I can imagine if you had time and you were on that airplane, you would think, I'm very disappointed in this design, uh, albeit for a very short time maybe. But this is a, a design disaster and due to some design flaws. Uh, here's another interesting one. These are all from long ago uh, for you. This is just a barge failure, but it, it's a picture of something I wanted to show you. It was like that, which is uh, Liberty ships. And this happened in World War II. When the U.S. got into World War II, they didn't have enough transport ships to take stuff from here mostly to Europe. They wanted to take supplies to Europe for the troops. And they started building Liberty ships. And these Liberty ships um, were a new design called all welding design. And they were built in a very big hurry. And this is one example of how fast they were built. One of these ships was built so fast that it started with just metal on the floor of a big shop to a completed ship in a little bit more than four days. Now, if you call somebody on the phone and you want to get an answer back, it usually takes more than four days, but they built a whole ship in four days. And I don't think we could do that anymore, but they did it then. What happened to these ships, though, with the new design and the material they used, they got into the cold North Atlantic and started to have cracks and failures. And uh, of more than 2,000, 400 had bad cracks and 20 of them were complete failures. They, they burst in two. And you can imagine being on such a ship and it bursts in two and sinks right into the cold North Atlantic just like that. And they, they were, um, they, they were like Titanic, I think, kind of like Titanic, except they didn't hit an iceberg. They just broke in two and went, went into the ocean. Now these are some spectacular failures but I wanted to show you failures because what we do in this design course, ME 466, is try to design little pieces without failing. And one of the little pieces is a helical spring. 
Now, helical spring isn't nearly as exciting as a ship or an airplane, but if I gave you the equations to design an airplane, which I don't even have, it would be quite a problem, uh, a lot of equations. Couple things, one, you know the, the old story about how one little part failed and it made something bigger fail and bigger fail and, until finally the whole country went down because somebody's little nail failed, something like that. Uh, just a story, but may, maybe true. Small parts can pay, play an integral part of some structure, and if a small part fails, then it could be a disaster. And so this could be part of a more complex system. But the big thing about the spring is that the equations are the easiest one of all the design problems we have. They're the easiest set of equations. If you can use these equations and optimize, we can go on to something more difficult. And if you can't use these equations and you, and you can't make it work, then we can't make it work, I guess. It's, so we want to do, we want to do, look at spring. To do the spring optimization, I have a paper handout, and I will hand out the handout. Uh, pass this one around. This has all the equations on, and rather than just say, here are all the equations, which here they are, I'm going to develop them on the board for you and show you springs. I brought some springs along and my computer still wanting to upgrade itself. So I think I may black this for the time being and write on the board. Which makes the screen go up. Yes. 